one through the Space for Women show series 11, Human Reproduction in Space, the challenges and conundrums. Today's uh, show certainly is a subject to space controversy, but perhaps uh, we as Space for Women, we owe it to ourselves, to the society we live in, to our children and our children's children to think long term. So while intimacy in space has not been high on the priority list of agencies, the survival of the human race could well depend on us getting a better understanding of how to reproduce in zero gravity. Our aim today is to discuss the space effects on human reproduction, the medical and physical challenges. We will also exchange ideas about what the different ethical questions raise and what did we learn from space biology experiments so far? And what are the consequences of an unbalanced gender representations in future space careers? So welcome everyone to Space for Women show and welcome Bianca Cefalo, our rocket scientist and STEM ambassador and moderator today. The floor is yours, Bianca. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everybody, for being here, speakers and guests. Um, it's, yeah, it's quite of a, an interesting topic that, and also a, a field in the space industry, which is very untapped at the moment, yet there are so many questions around it. So I'm going to present our speaker. So our first speaker is Dr. Rovina Christiansen. Thank you very much for joining us from Australia today, Rovina. My pleasure. She is a space medicine advocate and space health consultant. And today, our first questions around this all very interesting and controversial topic is, um, what are really the space effects or, well, the effects of the space environment on human biology and health so far? I shall just share my screen and then we will talk about that a little. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the things that I'm going to go through, a bit of a, a whistle stop tour, is looking at some of the space effects on human reproduction then considering pregnancy and childbirth in space and an interesting ethical question around that. Will we actually be creating a new race of humans? And the effect of gravity or the lack of gravity, the issues of that for reproduction in space. Thinking about medical care for human reproduction in space, the rights of the child in space and extreme environments. Uh, a little bit of a light-hearted look at conception in space and what the space tourism options might be and then some concluding remarks. So uh, to be serious for a moment that there are a number of effects on the human capacity to reproduce that we'll need to think about and being in an extreme environment such as space is stressful in itself. And also the astronauts have to spend a lot of time exercising each day and both of those can affect the menstrual cycle and estrogen production in females and there's also evidence of reduced ovarian function as a result of being in space. For men there's reduced levels of testosterone and sperm production and we probably need to think about age-related changes in fertility because a lot, lot of our astronauts will be mid-career and uh, probably in their 30s or even older. And for female astronauts, their fertility declines rapidly after the age of, of 35. And the effects of radiation, this is going to be one of the big challenges of going on a long trip to Mars. For women, that can lead to destruction of ovarian egg-producing cells and diminished estrogen for men, reduce sperm production, but perhaps most concerningly, the risk of genetic mutations in our offspring and also the risk of sterility or infertility. 
And I, I guess this whole issue of reproduction in space is, has been an elephant in the room because it's something that nobody's really wanted to, to talk about. And um, there, there are rumours about whether people have or haven't had sex in, in space. I can't, can't give you an accurate answer to that, but sooner or later it's definitely bound to happen. And if we start having children on the moon or on Mars or on other celestial bodies, then they're going to evolve to meet their environment just the same as we evolved to our 1G environment here on Earth. So I think there's a tantalizing ethical question as to whether they'll become a new subspecies of human. And gravity is actually a really important consideration in all of this. On Earth, we, we're used to our 1G. On the Moon, it's only one-sixth of that. On Mars, one-third of that. Whereas Jupiter is uh, 2.5 times Earth's gravity. So there's, there's going to be a lot of changing between gravitational environments as we travel from one place to another. And if, if you think about humans trying to get together in a microgravity environment, then the laws of physics apply. And things like the principle of reaction, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So we are going to have to intervene to actually have methods of keeping people essentially tied, tied together um, while they enjoy some intimacy. And Today I was, was thinking about all the parts of the reproductive process where gravity might actually be involved. And the first one is whether the sperm will actually know what direction to travel in if gravity isn't around because they've evolved to travel against gravity um, up into the fallopian tubes and towards the egg in order to be able to fertilize it. And then once the egg is fertilized, once again, will it know what direction to, to travel in because it's evolved to travel down the fallopian tubes and down into the uterus and implant into the uterine wall. And if, if it's a bit confused about where to go, there might be a high risk of ectopic pregnancies. And we probably also need to consider what happens with the normal physiological changes in pregnancy, which can be quite significant as far as the cardiovascular system and respiratory system are concerned. And they already experience adverse changes just from being in the space environment. And then when we get to the, the end of the pregnancy, it's a really important part of normal birth that the baby actually rotates to be head down so that its, its head is the presenting part when the mother gives birth. But um, you just lost the audio with the Rovena. Yeah, it looks like he froze. Rovena? Yeah, she froze. Yeah. Are you back? Thank you. Rovena, there, there, is a, there is an issue with your audio. We had that last time, Rovena. If this persists, just log out of the Zoom and log back in again. Oh, uh, apologies for that. My internet dropped out. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure where we got to, but maybe if I just go on with, with this slide. And if you go back to thinking about the laws of physics in the microgravity environment, then giving birth itself is a very dynamic process. So once again, we'd have to be able to keep the mother, mother in the one spot because there's a lot of pushing that's needed and the actual process of giving birth normally results in quite a bit of bit of blood and that can definitely be a problem in the microgravity 
environment, particularly if it's arterial blood, which will spurt out and form droplets. And one interesting fact that I found while I was researching was that pregnant rats who'd been in space needed twice as many contractions to deliver their young because of the weakened muscles that develop as a result of being in space. Emergency cesareans will be challenging both in terms of being able to do the actual surgery itself and the blood that's associated with that. And maybe some of you have seen the movie Prometheus, which uh, might give, me a give us a taste of how messy that might be. And also providing the mother with pain relief would be challenging because you can't use inhaled anesthetics like nitrous oxide because they'll pollute the whole of the uh, closed environment. Another potential issue is that if um, babies develop in the space environment, they might have not have the normal sense of up and down and sideways that we develop because of the influence of, of gravity. And there was another study that showed that unborn rat fetuses returning to Earth demonstrated um, an extreme sensitivity to their position being changed. And this was probably as a result of their inner ears not being used to the force of gravity as a result of growing up in lack of gravity. And both obstetrics and paediatrics require specialised medical knowledge, so we need to have the right sort of doctor to look after that. And that raises the question of do we take doctors who are generalists or specialists, or do we need to take both? And that can be an issue if space is at a premium, for instance, on the six to eight trip to Mars. Thinking about medical care, and communication delays. If you're on the International Space Station or on the moon, the delay is relatively small. But if you're on Mars, then there can be an eight to 24 minute delay each way. And whilst evacuation from the International Space Station and the moon is probably possible, uh, it's quite unrealistic for Mars. As a result, there's going to be a lot of reliance on telemedicine but that's dependent on things like electricity and technology in space weather. Therefore, the astronauts are going to need to have their own skills. And robotic surgery is really only in its infancy at this point in time. So at the moment, that's not something that they're going to be relying on when we first go to Mars. And on the ethical front, it's probably important to think about the rights of the child, whether we should actually be bringing in children into the most possible extreme environment that you can think of. For instance, on, on Mars, there's a 95% carbon dioxide atmosphere as opposed to our 21% oxygen atmosphere we have on Earth. And the gravity on Earth is 2.6 2 times that of Mars. So if a child was born on Mars and came back to Earth, they'd suddenly find themselves weighing two and a half times as much as they had on Mars. And if you think yourself, if you suddenly weighed two and a half times as much, how difficult it would be to move around. I, I think you can probably appreciate some of the challenges of transferring between gravitational environment. And probably quite a few of the rights of the child as encoded by the United Nations, you simply wouldn't be able to deliver in the space environment. And just to finish on the lighthearted note, uh, I believe there's been some discussion about people wanting to travel up to space to conceive. And so these, these are just a few pictures of some of the space hotel projects which have been mooted at the moment. It would be very, very expensive to go and stay there. Uh, for this particular one, a 12 day stay would cost $10 million. So probably not many of us have, have that amount of money. There are a, a couple of other options. Uh, Bigelow Aerospace, you probably all heard about that prototype 
habitat that went up to the International Space Station. On the, the bottom picture, there's a space station with the huge solar sails, but none, none of these are proposed to have um, an artificial gravity environment. So, but uh, if you remember the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey with the large rotating wheel, they did have artificial gravity. And there is one proposal which uh, is, has been put up by the Gateway Foundation to build the Von Braun Space Station, which will have artificial gravity at the same level as the moon. So, so in conclusion, I, I don't think we've really begun to scratch the surface of all the complex issues that we need to think about on both a physiological and ethical front if we want to be serious about permitting human reproduction in microgravity environments and also on other um, planets or bodies such as the Moon and Mars. And the best answer to many of these unknowns is going to come through animal models and I'm glad that Angela is going to be telling us a bit more about that. But I think probably the most important thing is that before we can start thinking about making this a reality that we need to move it from being the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about to being something that we, we talk about and discuss the same way that we discuss other aspects of the space program. So thank you very much. That's the, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Ravina. It was, it was an amazing presentation. And uh, as you've said, so far, um, talking reproduction or human biology, especially when it comes to women, pregnancy and period cycles, it is something that we tend not to speak about because it's still something that is completely not uh, understood from a microgravity level. Even if we think about astronauts, female astronauts are meant to have uh, birth control so they don't get periods when they are on a mission. So there are so many, uh, so many side topics to it. And it's so great that today you share with us uh, the majority. Okay, we really scratched the surface and we truly hope that we will not be the elephant in the room anymore. So on this, on this, on this note, uh, I love to present our next panelist, uh, Dr. Angelo Vermeulen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and the, Dr. Angelo Vermeulen, he's a space researcher and a space biologist and an artist as well. So we'd love to hear, Angelo, your perspective uh, from a biological point of view or what do we know so far about biology on bodies in space? And what have been the experiments done? Uh, what, what, what have we learned really from the experiments so far, if they have been just on animals, and if there is any chance that these experiments will move to humans? All right, uh, let me start by sharing my screen. <clears throat> Can you see my uh, my slide? Yep. All right, good to go. So yes, um, my goal is really today uh, to give a brief introduction into um, the angle from space biology, uh, uh, looking at this problem of human reproduction. It's pretty much impossible to give a full overview of all the kinds of experiments that have been done. Uh, I think some people underestimate space biology. It's an old field. Uh, it started in the 40s when people started sending uh, animals to space, insects to space, and it's been developing ever since. So as you can, as you can imagine, there's lots of information. I'm just going to give you an introduction, a few insights, and I hope this will set you on a path to do your own continued research on the internet if you find this uh, very interesting. Um, so there's a few topics that I want to explore today. Once again, this is usually I'm, I'm kind of touching the surface of most of the topics. We can engage in the discussion after my presentation um, because each of these topics is quite deep in itself. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, talking about a series of experiments in the field of space biology. I'm going to talk about cloning. 
uh, IVF in space, and then some bigger perspective um, uh, topics such as regenerative life support, self-replicating infrastructure, and then humans as a post planetary species. But let's start with some of the experiments. Um, like I said, uh, very early on in the space, in the, in the development of, of space exploration, researchers have been sending all kinds of animals to space. In the beginning, very small animals, but we all know uh, the famous uh, animals are probably, the most famous ones are probably uh, animals like Laika, the Russian dog that was sent to space, and then the, the chimpanzee, the American uh, uh, variation of sending an animal to space. Um, but biologists have also sent very small organisms to space, like all kinds of invertebrates. And so there are a few types of uh, results that came out of this. Uh, there was a study from the 90s, which was quite interesting because they built a kind of miniature aquatic ecosystem, which contained plants and animals. And the plants actually provided uh, oxygen for the organisms, and then the organisms provided CO2 for the plants again. So so it's basically a bit of a closed, small, miniature ecosystem with amphipods, gastropods, ostracods, and daphnia, all kinds of small aquatic organisms. And the results were that actually these organisms were doing quite well in space, and they were reproducing and they were going through a full life cycle, which seems good news. Um, there were other experiments that were done, for example, with jellyfish. Uh, also taking them to space and then allowing them to reproduce. And there some problems started to surface. And so one of the things that, uh, that was seen was that the, as soon as these jellyfish that were born in space were taken back to Earth, they had big difficulty uh, orienting themselves. And this is something that actually Rowena already brought up in her in the previous presentation, that one of the effects of development in weightlessness is indeed problems with, is, is indeed positional disturbance. So uh, organisms have a hard time um, orienting themselves. And interestingly, when they looked at the uh, gravity scepters, the organs that are responsible and give information to the jellyfish on how it's positioned, the, the structure of the gravity scepters of, of this organ was actually normal. So probably there is something wrong with the wiring of the gravity scepter or the signal uh, that is being uh, transmitted from that organ to the, to the cell. Um, there's also been all kinds of experiments with insects. They're very easy organisms to send to space because they're small, light, and hardy. Um, and in, in a drosophila experiment from the 60s, uh, some interesting uh, conclusion could be drawn as well. They did all kinds of experiments, sometimes uh, in, in certain conditions exposing the drosophila to both space radiation and microgravity, and then in other experiments kind of uh, only exposing them to one. What you can do, for example, is you can bring an organism in space, but you can put it in a centrifuge. And if you put it in a centrifuge, it will feel gravity. So you, the only effect you have is radiation. And that's how you can disentangle the effects and the causes of things that you observe in an organism. And so what they noticed is that in this drosophila, um, there were things like um, higher mortality uh, being in space, more when they were reproducing in space, higher mortality, uh, more chromosomal breakage, more recessive lethal mutations of the, of the DNA. Um, and the interesting thing is that especially the chromosomal breakage and these lethal mutations are typically things you would expect from radiation. The thing is, it was actually, uh, it got worse because of microgravity. So microgravity and radiation together really uh, make things worse in space. And it's, and it's really something important to, to keep in the back of your mind that when you're looking at things you're expecting from something like radiation, you might have to take into account all kinds of other detrimental effects of the space environment. And then the last one is uh, an example about cockroaches that was, uh, they were sent uh, with a photon mission, a Russian photon mission in 2007 to space, um, the, um, the, uh, the cockroaches reproduced in space, but uh, the offspring was born when they were back on Earth. And seemingly, these are the first organisms, the first Earthlings that are born on Earth that were actually conceived in space. I mean, that, that seems to be that. Now, when we move to vertebrates, um, there's also, once again, a whole range of information available. I've just selected a few to give you an idea of the, what kind of research is being done. 
what kind of insights have been gained. Um, both medaga fish, which is rice fish, and newt have been successfully mating and displaying the f successfully the first stages of development. So that seems to work out. Um, there is a caveat though. For vertebrates, mm, there hasn't been any full life cycle of an organism yet, meaning from mating to producing offspring and then allowing the offspring to mate again. That whole life cycle has not been completed in space yet. So we're still waiting for this to happen. Uh, the reason that we did this, we, were, we, we, we have done this for invertebrates, but not for vertebrates, is obviously it's much easier with small organisms because they're, um, their life cycles are much shorter and they're, they're, they take up less space. However, just like uh, Rowena already indicated, there are issues in reproducing in space. And for example, when we look at mice, um, it's a bit of a mixed, a mixed story there. There are experiments in which they brought male mice for a certain number of days into space and then brought them back and checked the fertility of the mice, and this did not seem to be affected. So astronauts had spent some time in, in the space station. It's, we could assume that they can still reproduce normally. However, when they were growing, um, when they were growing mice in, um, in systems where you would simulate microgravity, so it's basically like it's not really in space, but it's a machine that con constantly repositions itself. You could see that the birth rate was significantly uh, affected and went went down. So that's one of those examples in which you can see that it is possible to reproduce in space, but there are all kinds of detrimental effects on on, on reproduction, such as a lower birth rate. Um, there's also been experiments with rats that uh, um, rats that spent um, pregnant rats that spent some time in the International Space Station and came back to Earth, and there were negative effects. Uh, perinatal morbidity has had increased. Once again, another example of it is possible to reproduce, but there are problems. And interestingly enough, the sex ratio changed. So in comparison to the control group on Earth. Basically, the, the rats in space produced more, the female to male ratio was higher than on Earth. So somehow space seems to generate more females than males. I think in, in the context of this group, it was quite an interesting observation. Now, when we're talking about reproduction, we're not only talking about males and females uh, and sexual reproduction. There's also cloning. And this organism is a really good example of that. It's uh, called a rotifer. It's a very small, it's one of the smallest, probably the smallest animal on the planet. It's only about a thousand cells. It's a microscopic animal, it's a filter feeder, and it has some unique capacities. First of all, through evolution, they canceled men. There are no more males, they kicked them out. There's only females. Um, and some people call this an evolutionary scandal. Yes, of course, depends on the perspective you take. I guess men would call it an evolutionary scandal. I don't think everybody would call it like this. Um, but one of the other interesting properties of this organism is that you can desiccate it, it becomes a sort of spore, and this spore is highly resilient. It's quite spectacular. It's a bit like the, it's a bit like the tardigrades. Some of you might have heard of this organism, which also already has been out in space and survived outer space. This is a bit similar. This organism, when it, is a, when it is a spore, you can really expose it to all kinds of dangerous environmental conditions. But as soon as you drop, give it a drop of water, it will pop back to life. It will, it will start repairing its DNA. And even before its damaged DNA is repaired, it will already move around and look for food. So it's a really in, in, interesting organism. So the European Space Agency got interested in this organism. and. Um, this, this lab the, from Professor Karin van Donink, who's a Belgian professor and a friend of mine, um, they set up a series of experiments to investigate how, if this organism retains this capacity to repair its DNA in outer space, because that would be good news. That would be, learn, that would be a possibility to learn how DNA can be repaired in space, because DNA damage is one of the big problems in space. And interestingly enough, um, Karin uh, invited us, because I'm part of an art science collective, to make an artwork inspired by this uh, experiment. And that's what we did. 
the artwork is called Engines of Eternity. It's a multi-level art project, and we basically use these properties of these organisms of DNA repair and cloning, it's like an eternal organism, uh, as a departure point for an artwork that actually talks about cultural immortality. So we're using biology as a metaphor for a much broader cultural discussion. I can't really go into much detail here, it's not the goal of the project, but an important part of the project is that we've been sending an art, our first artwork to space in December last year, and we'll keep on resending and evolving the same artwork over multiple missions. I will give you the, the link to the project uh, website so you can read more about it later on. Now, all these uh, animal experiments bring us to what is actually happening right now. And I, um, one of the startups that I'm connected with as an external advisor is uh, Spaceborn United. And the two people uh, that, actually, that actually, uh, the CEO and one of the advisors are actually now part of the audience here. Um, and um, one of the interesting projects they're developing now is called ARTIS. It's basically an acronym for Assisted Reproductive Technology in Space. And what they're currently doing is, it's basically a project that is focused on space embryo incubator design for humans, for human embryos. And the idea is to re-engineer an ex existing uh, IVF embryo incubator technology to apply it in space, while uh, through adding radiation protection, artificial gravity, and cryopreservation. Um, so the idea is really to have a system where we can have fertilization in space and the very early stages of development in space, then bring the embryo back to Earth and then uh, develop it there further. And this is to be launched with uh, Virgin Orbit. The discussions have already been ongoing. So this could be one of the very first steps of human reproduction in space. And like I said, um, people from the, from, the, from the company are here. They, they could answer more questions about this. So, where are we in, in this story? We have established that reproduction in space is possible. There are detrimental problems, but we could assume that by investigating problem by problem, we can slowly so sort out solutions for all these problems. And we could develop colonies in space, settlements in space of humans and other organisms all living together. Now, there are a few ecological consequences if you bring growing human populations into space. And that's something I want to briefly address. If you have a, a colony and you keep on um, allowing the population to grow, every human, of course, is, a re is, is built of molecules. They need to come from somewhere. You need to have enough resources to keep growing your population. If we're talking about just one or two people, that's, very, that's pretty easy. But if we're talking about larger populations, this will require particular resources. We don't really think about this on Earth because we have limitless reservoirs we have an atmosphere which which seems limitless there is enough oxygen there but in space every single molecule is valuable and so what we will have to uh, use in those circumstances of growing human populations is regenerative life support this is life support that actually con continuously recycles waste that comes out of a human body every molecule that comes out of a human body toilet waste co2 sweat Everything needs to be captured and will be broken down by a series of bioreactors with different microorganisms and will then be transformed again into food and CO2 for plants that then provide food and oxygen for the astronauts again. A fully closed loop system. This is already in development. Uh, both China and Europe have pretty advanced systems. The European system is called MELISSA. Uh, I've been working on this system for a number of years now. I've been building a virtual version of the system and I'm running virtual experiments um, with this system. Something else that we will need is self-replicating infrastructure. This might come a bit as a surprise, but imagine you have a growing human population uh, and they, they, need to, they need housing and they need infrastructure to survive. You don't want your people to continuously be uh, worried about building more infrastructure. There's, it's very dangerous. There is limited time. So you would rather prefer a system that actually self-replicates and builds itself. And so this is something that I've been working on for the past number of years at Delft University of Technology, focusing on interstellar exploration, multi-generational interstellar exploration. How to design a spaceship 
for a large human population that is increasing and traveling over multiple generations through deep space. And the idea we came up with was basically to use an asteroid as a resource and then using 3D printers and mining, mining systems, gradually mine the asteroids and use the refined materials to, de to develop a growing spaceship structure that comes out, out of the asteroid and builds itself also inside of the asteroid. And the machines that are actually responsible for creating this infrastructure are have a self-replicating capacity. So whenever the system can't keep up, keep up with providing the proper infrastructure, it can increase its own capacity and it can self-replicate, which is pretty interesting in, in terms of what we're talking about today. So what I'm actually saying here is if we want humans to replicate in space, we will need technologies that can replicate themselves to sustain uh, larger uh, communities of, of, of people in space. And my last point is, if this all works out, we'll end up becoming a post-planetary species. I prefer to talk about post-planetary species and not so much about multi-planetary species because my vision, and which is you know similar to a lot of science fiction, is that at a certain stage in the development of human civilization, living on the surface of a planet or a moon is one of the options of humanity. We'll be living on these in these places, but also in generation starships, in, 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 in colonies, in orbits around planets, uh, and there will be all these different types of physical locations to which humanity is spread. And one of the things, one of the things that I that I think is a, is a danger here or a risk here is that humanity will basically evolve. There will be a physical evolution. Different types of people might, might different body types might emerge. Uh, there will also be a cultural evolution. Different types of culture will evolve in all these different places. And so we risk diversity. That's the, the, the downside of diversification, that we risk alienation and polarization. And there might be political consequences of this. I think um, a science fiction series like The Expanse, for example, is one of the few series which, re which really uh, uses this and tackles this, explores this, uh, this problem of the future uh, of humanity. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Let me just briefly wrap up. I started talking about space biology and all kinds of experiments with animals, which all also brought me to cloning and IVF in space. And, and what, is, what is the conclusion here? Well, um, like I said, there has been no full life cycle for vertebrates yet, so we still have to wait to observe what happens when a vertebrate goes from mating to full development to reproducing again. But reproduction is possible for organisms. There are just several detrimental impacts. And I must say it's important to keep in mind that there is a difference between microgravity and surfaces like Mars and the Moon. If you have a minimum amount of gravity, that will make a lot of difference. So basically what we'll have to do is we'll have to investigate for each individual organism that we want to take, how to optimize the conditions and protect the organism, and specifically for, a spe specifically for each location. If you want to bring a specific type of fish and mice and snails to space, you'll have to develop a whole different kind of infrastructure if you want to have them alive and reproducing in a space station or on a colony of Mars. It's all possible, it will just take time and a lot of biologists to help out. Um, and then last but not least, if we take a bit of a, a bigger perspective, if we manage to bring humanity to the stage where, they can, where it, it can reproduce itself in space, we will need to think this through. We will need to think along sustainable sustainability lines, we will need closed loop systems, self-replicating architecture that uses local resources. We're not going to depend on resources from Earth. Um, and as soon as that is established, we'll, this will generate, uh, this will have political consequences that we'll have to be careful about. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Angelo, for this wonderful overview. Uh, I've, I've learned myself a lot. Uh, I had no idea even about the, 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 the evolutionary shock of a species that cancelled male <laughs> completely from the, from the equation. And uh, it, it really seems like uh, 
somehow the, the female DNA is resilient to the space environment, at least from these very early stage experiments, which is a very curious event and also news to, to know. Um, now, as you've concluded with a, a futuristic perspective of what could be a post-planetary species, and the political implications of it. So, uh, first of all, we have lots of questions from the audience, and I'm sure that most of them are also related to the ethical uh, implications of it. So, um, Hien, do we want to start uh, with our audience questions, and then we can go with you on what could be the consequences of uh, an unbalanced gender representations for the future of space and our planetary species. Sure, go ahead with Q&A. Okay, perfect. So we can, um, for everyone that has dropped the questions in the chat, so do you wanna come on the screen and ask directly to our speakers? I see Satyam, Kivari, and Stacy, there are lots of questions. So if you would love to ask them in person, you can. Otherwise, I'll go and ask for on your behalf. No? Divya? Okay. Divya? Divya asked. Yeah. Okay, she's. Hi. So uh, thank you uh, all for uh, joining this amazing uh, call. And this is the most important and necessary uh, conversation or like, you know, initiative that we have to take right now. And um, I have a question for both the speakers and um, anybody could help me out. And do we, uh, how do we make or encourage women astronauts and explorers to feel safe in space by providing safe reproduction possibilities, you know, thereby not restricting their reproduction cap cap capacity, you know, uh, capability. And how long will it take to achieve this? Like, you know, an approximate timeline, uh, like, you know, years, five years, 10 years, and how, how does it work? Okay, this is something for Rowena. Uh, yes, there, there are a lot of great questions there. And uh, thank you for those. I, I think at the moment, a lot of it comes back to the, the ethics of what we don't know about human reproduction in space. So uh, we, we don't really know whether it's going to be safe for, for women to carry a pregnancy while they're living in microgravity conditions and to deliver a baby and what, what the baby will be, be like once it's born. And so, so I think uh, probably from the ethical side, uh, people in charge of the space program wouldn't want that to happen until we have some better evidence from vertebrates like, like Angela was talking about earlier that might give us a, a better idea on that. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, when women do become pregnant, there are some quite significant physiological changes that occur. Uh, with their cardiovascular system, with their, their blood pressure, uh, with the actual thickness of their, their blood, their respiratory capacity. And quite a few of those are probably maladaptive for a space environment as well. So that's going, going to be a bit of a consideration to, to work all of that out. And just, just from a purely practical point of view in the microgravity environment, because any fluid droplets can be a big problem, things, things like menstruation are going to be quite challenging to manage. So, so at the moment, they, they have a suction toilet, which is, which is used for, for urine and, and feces, which both genders can use. But if you start introducing menstrual fluids, um, then that might become a problem and what happens to the menstrual waste and, and so on. So I think probably for the, um, at least the foreseeable future, uh, women astronauts will continue to use um, long-term long birth control just to avoid the risk of um, accidentally becoming pregnant. And I think that's going to be really important when we start sending people to Mars because 
there's going to be a, a six to eight month trip to Mars and you you could see see the problem if somebody ac um, accidentally did become pregnant that they could actually um, gestate a, a baby which ended up needing to be born on Mars or born in space and at the moment we, we really don't don't know how to handle that so I'm sure that eventually we'll work out all these problems, particularly with, with research from, um, from vertebrates. And you're absolutely right that once we do have that level of knowledge, then, then we should be making women feel, feel safe, that that's, that's part of their gender identity, that, that they have the possibility to, um, to reproduce and have a family. And if it's their, their choice to live in space or live, live on Mars, then that should be part of what being human means for them. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rovena. That's a question for Angelo. Mikhail, do you want to get asked him directly? Else we're going to read the question for you. It's actually interesting. I, I saw it popping up and I was like, oh, I want to answer this. <laughs> yeah. so, so Mikhail is asking, when talking about self-replicating architecture to match the reproductions of humans in space, do you see a specific natural structure that could possibly serve as a base for such architecture? Yes, this is actually uh, the core of my work at TU Delft. It's called bio-inspired engineering. Uh, it's a slightly different than uh, the field that a lot of people know, which is biomimicry. Biomimicry is a, is a, is a, is a part of that. Bio-inspired engineering is a much bigger umbrella. The thing with biomimicry is biomimicry, you use a very particular solution from nature and you translate it into engineering. Bio-inspired is more like you grab, you take concepts and principles from biology and you bring them to engineering. And um, one of the typical, one of the key characteristics of planning for interstellar exploration is you are dealing with uncertainty, high levels of uncertainty. And this is almost a contrast with the tradition of space exploration where you try to anticipate all kinds of things that could go wrong. And uh, rocket scientists basically design their rockets, um, taking into account all these possible things that could go wrong and do a lot of testing before they finally um, reach their target. It was only Apollo 11 that landed on the moon and they needed those 10 previous missions to gradually map all those uncertainties. Now for interstellar exploration, that's impossible. You can go a little interstellar, go all the way back to Earth and then fix a few things. So you need to have a different design philosophy, a different engineering philosophy. And that's where we can learn from biology. That's where we can come up with the idea of a spacecraft that develops itself. And basically the ideas that we're exploring are based on things like termite mounds. Termite mound is a classic example of a structure where it's a very highly engineered structure with uh, dealing with, with uh, air circulation and such, but there is no plan. There is no blueprint of a termite mount. It's because the termite mounts are working in a, in a kind of semi-decentralized way that each time the termite mount is slightly different but optimized for those local conditions. And it's this concept that we're actually using. So why are we using this? First of all, to deal with those uncertain futures, but also by maximizing decentralization, we avoid a single point of failure. And a single point of failure is really key to avoid in these long-term space missions. And it's beautifully illustrated in, a, in movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey, where you, you do have a central computer that can really shut down everything, and this is what you want to avoid. So yes, we are, in, we are using uh, examples from biology, but a bit more from a conceptual perspective. Satyam asked, can any mutations help in mitigating problems related to reproduction in space? Um, can you, yeah, um, um, well, theoretically they could, right? Um, and this is the thing, um, future astronauts will be augmented or should be augmented. And human augmentation is something we know from cyberpunk. There's actually, an, 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 for long-term space exploration, it will be part of the, of the story. There's a lot of ethical pushback there. Um, but for example, gene therapy to, pro to make sure that astronauts are withstanding radiation better could be an option. It is already established that different astronauts have a different capacity to withstand or to deal with radiation and it's genetic, the base is genetic. So you can imagine 
maybe to a gene therapy, to a justice in, in, in the future, but also a combination of, of things with drugs, etc., etc. So I do think that yeah, augmenting the human body and mutations could be part of that, and a futuristic scenario could help in establishing humanity in space. Uh, uh, Rowena, what do you think about this? I, I think you're right. I think at, at the moment the astronaut population is very carefully chosen so that they're, they're the best possible human specimens. And as time goes by, if we do discover that there, there are certain genetic profiles that are protective against things like uh, radiation damage, then, then uh, I probably would counter argue from an ethical point of view, it would be wrong not to use them. Yeah, and I, I read uh, a really interesting little article about some um, mice that was, was sent into space and of course they experience a little bit more radiation while they're on the International Space Station and that their offspring were actually slightly more resistant to radiation than, than uh, normal mice which develop here on Earth. So, so that was quite interesting in itself as well. But, but I think it'll be essential, particularly as we push further into the solar system and, and beyond that we have to have humans as well optimised as possible to, to deal with the extreme environmental challenges here. Adrian asked, will it be safe for children to travel to space on short sub-audible sub flights? Uh, my, my answer to that would be yes, so long as they're, they're old enough to understand the safety considerations and, and follow all the instructions uh, that, that are required in the event of an emergency. So probably you wouldn't want to be taking really young children up, but probably children from about seven years onward who are able to, to understand. I can't see any reason why they wouldn't be able to go on a suborbital flight. How do we avoid the dangerous uh, radiation that affect the pregnant women in space? I, I think radiation is one of the, the last great challenges as far as um, space travel is concerned. And it's one, one of the things that we're going to need to get a better um, solving of before we, we go to Mars. And they've, there are lots of suggestions which have been made, ranging from protective clothing to um, wrapping spacecraft into, into water tanks or um, having special sections of the craft to, to uh, use for people to shield themselves during solar flares and so on. But, but at the moment, there's no one really good answer to that question, but there are a lot yeah. of people working on it. Yeah, the thing with uh, radiation is it's actually uh, one of the key concerns when we're talking about going to Mars. And it's sometimes a bit uh, brushed under the rug uh, in narratives of visiting Mars. But this is really one of the things that we actually have no idea about. Um, and human, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Rowena, but uh, what is typical for a mission to Mars, for example, is a very prolonged exposure to space radiation. The radiation itself is not extremely high. It's only very high in turn when it's a solar flare, but there is no studies when humans are exposed to medium or low levels of radiation over such a long time. Um, there are studies of the effects of radiation on, on the human body, but they're usually short bursts of higher intensity. So we don't really know anything about this. And that's why it's really crucial to keep supporting um, uh, projects like uh, the Gateway, um, because the Gateway is actually an, a, a space station that is designed to research this kind of effect because it's further away from Earth, there's more radiation, and we can start understanding more what happens with the human body. And then the second thing that I briefly want to bring up, um, the, the interesting thing with shielding is if you shield against radiation, there's always the annoying risk of secondary radiation. So you protect against the original particles that come in, but the original particles slam into the molecular structure of your shield, and then that generates particles originating from the shield material that enter the spacecraft. And so you're, you're, still, you're still being bombarded with particles. So that's, that's another, another issue. However, uh, shielding materials are in full development. And for example, um, 
metal phones seem to have a unique capacity. This is basically metal with a lot of holes, like a, like a cheese, uh, and they seem to have a huge capacity for shielding better than, than many things that have been tried before. So there is advancement there. Thank you, Angelo. There's a last question we can answer. Uh, can we hatch eggs in space microgravity and what will be the result? Yeah, well, that's I, I basically tried to answer this a bit in, in, in my presentation, even though I didn't talk a lot about eggs themselves, but hatching eggs. I'm not sure if you were talking about birds or, or it's um, we're talking about all, all kinds of other organisms, but like I said, um, most organisms are capable of reproducing themselves in space. This includes, includes hatching. Of course, if, you have, if we're talking about birds, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to figure out a system to heat up, to keep the eggs at the right temperature, but that shouldn't be too much of a problem. So my guess is that, yes, it won't be so much of a problem. Okay, we covered them all. If you have further questions, you can you feel free to follow up and we try to follow up with the speakers with all of your questions. Bianca. Yeah, so thank you very much everybody for all your questions and the speakers mostly for your very insightful uh, answers. Uh, now, one of, we can cover really the, the last remark, which is possibly the, 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 the biggest wrap up of it all with Ian. And it is really about what will be the consequences of gender imbalance for space careers. So why do we really worry about reproduction and radiations against human bodies and especially female bodies and the womb? Uh, because is this something that could really affect women getting into space careers as astronauts, as physicists or anything else? Well, it will certainly compromise essential space life science progress among many other things. It would certainly slow down opportunities for achieving sustainable and balanced human settlements on the moon, on the Mars and beyond. Therefore, the Space for Women Network uh, serves as purpose to provide those opportunities for these women and girls in STEM education and in the space sector because a diverse and inclusive environment leads to greater innovation and success. And we know that 90% of future jobs will require at least some degree of STEM and related skills. Therefore, it's vital to prepare girls and young women for this future employment and support them. So this increasing participation of women and girls in STEM and space fosters women in economic empowerment, which then has a direct benefit on the quality of life of women, children and families overall, contributes to financial freedom, better nutrition, quality of life in general, and serves as a step towards uh, gender parity. So uh, our hope is that we can shape a world where these new technologies that we today learned with the artists, one example, bring as much benefit with as little harm, hopefully, on the human body as humanly as possible. As you know, sir, Space for Women Networks mentors, we hope to continue to bring the benefits of space to women and girls so that the benefits reach everyone, everywhere and to work towards gender equality and women's empowerment in STEM and space. So this is a call to action for collaboration and need for support and, co uh, and uh, cooperation to really reduce the gender gap in STEM education, in careers, and also in leadership positions in the space sector. So therefore, I thank everyone today for your excellent participation, questions, the panelists for your great presentations. Um, thank you for being present today and participating. And it seems like this uh, theme could be furthered. And I know with Dr. Edget, and uh, this is an ongoing conversation. We had a lot of traction. We had also concerns, um, but uh, we are glad that we removed hopefully the elephant today <laughs> from the room as, as women, not as organizations. So very grateful for part your participation. Everyone stay healthy and stay safe. And we hope to see you in series 12. 
the theme will be revealed soon. Thank you very much, everyone. We would like to take a group picture with everyone, okay. if you choose to turn your camera on. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful weekend, everyone. All Thank right. you, everybody, for being with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.